Climb into the cockpit with pilot and Wing Square's Chief Legal Officer, Tim Perilla, as he invites legal leaders aboard to share advice that will help you navigate even the most turbulent times of in-house counsel work. We'll cover a range of topics from data privacy to legal team structure to public company transactions and beyond. You don't want to miss this series. Fasten your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff. You're listening to Cockpit Council. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Cockpit Council. Today we have Ellen Zavian with us, the general counsel at USA Lacrosse. Ellen, welcome. Thank you for having me. Hi, Ellen. How are you doing? Great. So uh, so this is a pilot-themed podcast, and so we always start off every episode the same way. And uh, I have to ask you, what is your pre-flight ritual? I like to work, work out in the morning. That, that gets my day started, if that would be a pre-flight. Um, I, is is I, that what you mean by pre-flight? I mean, like I, literally, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I need a definition. <laughs> like literally before you get on a plane. Oh, yeah. before I get on a plane. Uh I don't know. I'm not crazy about flying. So I would say I, I look up and say, hey, take me to my destination, please, because I'm out of control and I like to be uh, slightly more in control. <laughs> That's fair enough. There there are definitely. So uh, so I actually started flying because um, uh, because I was I was a nervous flyer. So uh, I had to start flying more for work. Like early, early on in my career, I had to start flying more for work. And, you know, I was flying probably once, you know, once to twice a month, uh, like one to two separate trips. So, you know, two to four flights per month. And, um, and I, didn't, I didn't like the feeling. So I started, uh, I, I started taking flight lessons. And I got about three flight lessons deep. And when the nerves subsided, it became excitement, which was a lot of fun. So, so I have a good plane story uh, to start us off. So, I was uh, testifying in the Sacramento legislation on a bill that would have cut workers' comp rights to women athletes, and uh, in that hearing, there were some people from the NFL, and Joe Montana flew over to speak to the legislation, and I had a meeting back in San Francisco. So he offered to fly me on his plane back nice. to San Francisco. So we get to his plane and it's like a six seater, really small. And we're both in front. And I, I turned to Joe and I say, look, this, this is, you know, if we go down, it's going to be Joe Montana and passenger. <laughs> I am not going to get the lead on this. <laughs> so you pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> so then, then when we landed and it was great, we landed and I just turned to him and said, look, you got enough money to have two engines, having one engine, not a good idea. You need two. And he just laughed and we parted ways. <laughs> That's incredible. That I didn't I didn't realize that Joe Montana was a pilot. But that's that's uh that's awesome. You know, I would have said the same thing to him. I definitely, <laughs> uh, personally, I feel better flying uh, flying a twin engine than I do a single engine. But now with some of the singles that they have, there's a lot of them are really really dependable. And then uh, and then you know there are certain uh, certain makes and models of planes that actually have a parachute that that you pull. Which is uh, which is pretty interesting. So let's let's talk a little bit about your career path. You've got an incredibly interesting career path. Would love to have you uh, walk us through it. Um, you know, beginning beginning to today. We'll do the fast version because I don't like talking about career paths, but I do think <laughs> life is just a journey, and I don't really focus on the end goal. I try to focus on the journey itself and be super present at the moment. So that's, that's sort of where I'm at, but I, I am determined. I've been told at my high school reunion that uh, none of my friends were surprised by my career path uh, because apparently I was quite motivated in middle school and grammar school. 
which I did not remember. But I think for the most part, it's, it's about building my pie. And people will look at my career and say, oh my gosh, she's just in everything. And what is she doing? And I just look at it as I'm, I'm building my pie and I'm a whole pie to start with. And how I divide that pie up is my choice. And there are common ingredients in each slice of the pie. And so I like to think of myself as fairness and the theme of being your David when you know when you meet Goliath is really who I am throughout my career. So starting with NFL players at the NFL PA, working through the strike in 87 to get them rights and uh, percentages of revenue streams, and then moving on to be an agent for players that needed help and were being uh, really screwed by their first agents was really my primary task of fixing those issues and letting the players leave me in a better state than they found me from an educational standpoint, as well as a monetary standpoint and a mental wellness standpoint. And then moving on to uh, X gamers. So inliners and BMXers and uh, skateboarders. And so they hired me to represent them on their images with Disney ESPN in the X games And as they said, Disney had a suit, they wanted their own suit. So uh, I was pretty excited about that because my first part of my 20 years in the career, I was a woman in uh, as an agent, but the X gamers in 2000, you know, really made me realize like they could care less what my gender was. I was just wearing a suit. Um, Prior to that, in 96, I should go back in order. I represented the women's soccer and softball players in disputes with the USOPC, as well as the Soccer Federation. And Nike was somewhat involved as well because they had invested money in the teams. And they were gaining rights and created the first collective bar agreement for female athletes in the Olympics and pregnancy leave clause was part of that collective bar agreement, did their world cup in 98 as well agreement. And we created group licensing, um, which, you know, I took from the NFL players association and my days there. And then I would say after the inliners and X gamers, I moved to, um, Break dancers. So I had a child in 2005. So after the action sport athletes, I moved on to having a child and my child went into break dancing. And then I realized this is a great sport that could meet the mission statement of the IOC. And after uh, a presentation to one of the breakers, my son's teacher, I said, let's move this into an association. Let's start to organize it. And Red Bull had already started organizing events. So I thought there needed to be a player's side to it. And 10 years later, it was announced that Paris 2024 would have breakdancing in it. So that's awesome. Can't be super excited. I'm going. I'll be there in the front row. And I'm sure there'll be lots of tears. Uh, in my eyes. So I'm looking forward to that. That's and, incredible. And now I'm at lacrosse, USA lacrosse. My son is a lacrosse player. And uh, we are on the cusp of being considered for LA 2028, but we're competing against yeah. breaking in okay. the LA 2028 <laughs> list of teams. Yeah. So my son and I are at complete odds with each other, and I love it. Uh, He's involved in putting a petition together to beat me out. So I feel like I've checked the box in teaching him that one person can make a difference. And I was just recently appointed by the Maryland governor for the racing commission to protect horses. And I see them as athletes. So my life has come full circle because I started my career in sports 
in college, I worked at the three racetracks. Okay. And my degrees in marketing, and I was really, really learning quite a bit from the woman that did the marketing in the infield for the Preakness. It went from an infield of drunk kids to a corporate tent. And she was one of the first to develop that corporate tent concept. So life's a full circle. It's a big pie. And the theme has always been fighting for the underdog. That's that's awesome. That's an incredible, incredible journey. Um, maybe maybe you can talk a little bit more about um, about how you how how did you get into uh, to player agency specifically? You know, I um, I was interested in sports, but not from the perspective of being a lawyer in sports. I just thought. It was, it was interesting from a negotiation standpoint. I, I love negotiations. Um, just it's a game to me and it's a lot of people games. So I was intrigued. I cycled over. I was a triathlete, competitive bodybuilder, marathon runner. So I cycled over from American University where I went to law school to Howard one day. They were having a sports panel met the woman from the panel and the NFLPA, and she was buying a bike. She asked me questions about my bike. And then she said, hey, we have this internship program. Would you like to come over to the NFLPA? And I was like, sure. And <laughs> when I went back to my dean and said, hey, I need credits for this internship, he said, oh, that's not law. You're, you're working in sports that that has nothing to do with law. And you have to realize this was 1986. Right. Uh, and I had to get everyone in the legal department and my direct boss, which who created the cap, Mike Duberstein, uh, he had to write a letter stating, oh, no, she'll she'll be doing law for sure. And uh, and so as I started helping the agents in the agency department to negotiate their contracts, I would put together their package of what they had to go into with the room. I realized that one, they weren't that much smarter than me. <laughs> Two, I had access and knew how to do research probably better than them at some right. point. And then three, I really got a lot of phone calls from players who agents were screwing them over and they were calling me to represent themselves. And yep. I had a player that said, if you, if you leave, when you leave, I'll, I'll come with you. And awesome. um, so I called around to different agencies at the time. They were the biggest, biggest agents in the industry and they only wanted to hire me as secretary. And I said, you know, I went to law school, had already been a legal secretary. I think I'm, I'm good with not yeah. being a secretary again. Yeah. So there was one gentleman in Pennsylvania that was willing to hire me as an agent, as well as director of his marketing company. And he had players mostly from Penn State. So we began to represent the players together. And then I went out and recruited um, soon after I started, one of the partners um, uh, assaulted me. And so I decided after a year that I needed to go on my own. So I went home and I said, Dad, I'm, I'm ready to go out on my own. And he went to the basement, got a door, two filing cabinets and made me a desk uh, nice. got a phone, got a phone line and, uh, and started my business at 26. And I come from a long line of, uh, businesses, the people that own their own businesses. And my family has a business for almost a hundred years. Yeah. So this is not out of the ordinary for, you know, to do what my dad did. Yeah. It's, it's in the family line, right? <laughs> It is. My Sundays growing up were surrounded by relatives uh, that started the bank, uh, owned 
the stationery store, the gas station, the plumbing store, the bike store, and the conversation around my table. And they owned the building they all lived in. So they were property owners. So I, I have no idea what it's like to sit at a table without discussions of business and politics. Uh, but, I, but now I know it's, that's quite odd. I, I didn't know that at the time. Well, that's that's an incredible background. I mean, one of the things that one of the things that we talk a lot uh, a lot about here on Cockpit Council is, um, is uh, our our audience is you know in house attorneys and and folks who you know maybe recently made that transition or are thinking about making that transition. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about though is how to best transition and what are some of the challenges to transitioning in house from a law firm role. It sounds like it sounds like having that business background for you, this was just like second nature to to have the business lens first. Well, it was interesting. You know, I was a business major, uh, marketing and management, and that was very unusual for someone. I finished my undergrad in three years. I really wanted to get to law school, obviously. But a lot of my friends in law school were poli sci. And I remember having a discussion with my mother on my major in college. And she said, what are you going to do with poli sci if you don't go to law school? Like, what the heck do you do with that major? <laughs> she said, everything's a business. You either selling yourself or selling an idea, you know, and now that you know my background, that that's not surprising. And so I took business classes. And at the time I met with some judges when I was entering law school. And I said, you know, should I should I get my JD MBA? It was something new. You could do it jointly. And I think they were old school judges. And they said, no one's going to hire you for both. They're either going to hire you for one or the other. And ironically, my business knowledge is 90% of my day. Yeah. But my lens is through a legal lens. And I think one of the things that's most important in that transition is creating an environment when you get to a location where the non-lawyers in the community and your colleagues at work feel comfortable. They see you as a lawyer, but you have to speak their language. Being a chameleon is really critical. I spent the first six months here just creating a trust, a trust and listening. And I know that sounds odd. I, sh I should have touched down and hit the ground running and created policies and governance and all those things, but I didn't. I just began for the first six months just answering their questions, helping them out. And now in my second year, I'm moving towards creating those governance documents that were well needed in the organization. And so being that, being a little bit more patient with the people around you can go a long way. I would also say I worked at the Association of Corporate Counsel. So I had 50,000 in-house counsel <laughs> uh, membership around me. And I learned quite a bit. And if you, if you want to be an expert in a particular area, you know, you have to be in-house in a very large department because then you would have a niche. But yep. for me, I wanted to be a sort of jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. And you have to be willing to lean on your colleagues and trust their knowledge because they are a niche knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think about in-house practice as very much uh, as separate and distinct of a practice as, um, IP, you know, uh, I, IP like pat, like patent filings, right. An IP attorney is from a class action litigator. Like it's like very, very distinct. And the skill set that makes you successful is, is pretty different. Right. And it's kind of like being a lawyer and being a good one, a competent one, is just sort of the the entry but where your real value is is you become an expert in the organizations and and to hear you say that you spent the first six months the first six months uh learning the organization and building those re relationships it's no wonder you're as successful as you are 
Like that's, I mean, th that uh, in my mind, that's that's more than half the battle. I think that's the primary purpose why you're hired is to to build those relationships and and grow that expertise and and be that that person who can speak the language of of the business itself and can articulate uh, the 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 means and ends of the business. It, it's it's an essential it's an essential part of the uh, of of the practice area. I'd say. So so I think you know being that chameleon and developing skills that not necessarily make you the smartest like the smartest person in the room shouldn't be your tone of voice. It's you know if if I'm the smartest person in the room I'm in the wrong room. Right. Right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that you're doing besides uh, besides USA Lacrosse. You, you're a professor. Uh, you've got uh, you've got a couple of different um, journals, uh, blogs. You also have a podcast. Would love to learn learn more about all of that. So I've been a professor at GW for 30 years, but during that time, I've taught at various law schools. AU, my my alum being one of them. Uh, and I've taught for the State Department in Cyprus, for the embassy in Cyprus on negotiating for high school. And during the pandemic, I taught eighth graders online on no how kidding. to be an entrepreneur. So I think the, the key component for me is, first of all, my mother was a teacher. And I think we're all teachers and we should all take that responsibility that I often say to people, my tombstone might say the first female NFL agent. It now might say helped get breaking in the Olympics. But what I really wanted to say is she paid it forward. And when I say that, when I said that to my students, uh, the last class this semester, one of my one of my students said, I think you just need a taller tombstone, Professor Zavian. <laughs> <laughs> you can have all three. <laughs> and I love that. And that's yeah. that's what I love about students. They're 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 fresh. They push you. You you've got to know more about things. So I jump into AI, I jump into esports, I jump into you know gaming because I need to teach it. And that's, that's what it pushes you to, to be not just enough. I just need to know a little bit more than them for the class. But then I have experts come in and I learn from them as well. And so what teaching has provided me is the energy for the next generation. I get to pose the questions that they will have to deal with, whether it's transgender athletes or LGBTQ issues in Title IX. And I simultaneously, I get to learn myself. And, you know, my dad's 93, goes to work every day in New York City. And he always is learning. During the pandemic, he taught himself a completely new trade. I mean, at 91, <laughs> he taught himself something new. And that's what I've been around my whole life. And if you're done learning, you might as well get off the train. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think we have a couple of uh, a couple of questions here. Alyssa, you want to jump yeah. in? Um, well, I guess the obvious one is that you must have amazing time management skills. So what does a typical day look like for you? And do you have any tips for listeners? Well, you know, I was a ballerina for 14 years. <laughs> so people ask me, what was my greatest sport? And I say ballet. Uh, I think it's just the discipline. And I get up at 530 I'm out the door and I crash around 9 30, 10 for sure. I don't, I don't know. I I'm worried about this next generation on time management. I tell my students that I, that seems to be something in the last three, four years because of the pandemic and not having to travel and you can't put in time to travel I'm worried about time management for the next generation, but somehow it seemed to work for me. And the other answer I would say is I have an incredible amount of energy. Um, my mom had a lot of energy. My grandmother had a lot of energy. I just, it's just part of me. 
And I see it in my son. People always say to him, you, you have an incredible, you know, incredible amount of energy. So it's just DNA. I love that. Um, okay, another one uh, relating to how you spoke about being on the cutting edge. So how do you think technology is changing the role of legal professionals? So I think the legal profession needs to embrace the technology and AI and find the nuances of where they can provide uniqueness to that. So AI only knows what it what it knows and doesn't know what it doesn't know. And so where you fit in that doesn't and know is going to be critical. I look at my son and he's trying to pick a profession and law might be his ultimate profession, not sure, but how his skill sets need to be different than mine because of the technology. And so he's looking at behavioral science and how the mind works. And I think that will be a critical component for an attorney moving forward, that we are still human to human and we are still negotiating with humans. And, and what does that mean for the legal profession? We may not write the contract, but we have to get the two people in the room on the same page. And that's gonna take a skill set that you need to develop. Absolutely. Um, and then another one is, what is the number one thing you look for when you're hiring somebody? I look for three things and nothing has to do with their knowledge on a particular topic, which is <laughs> terrible to say. I look for passion, organization, and the ability to communicate well and listen. Part of communication is listening. And I don't see my team as working for me. I always look at them as they're working with me. Yeah, that's a that's a great philosophy, and I you know I I couldn't agree more. I know when um, when I've built my teams, I you know I've built the legal team and government affairs at DraftKings, built teams here as well. It's always been are these are these people hungry? Are these people motivated appropriately? And are are they good people that you want to work with who? Um, who can not only get the job done, but like can, can can communicate and 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 be effective in their communication across different types of people, right? So when you're working in in house, my my entire career has been in house, but um, when you're working in house, you have to you have to recognize that you're not dealing with lawyers, and you have to deal with people in in a little bit of a different way and bringing a, a certain amount of empathy to the conversation and to the way that you approach, uh, approach the practice. I mean, one of the things my mom used to say when she got to a new school is she wouldn't go to the principal first. She'd go to the janitor because yeah. she needed lights, desks, and chairs. <laughs> 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 so I, I sort of take that on from her. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, it was awesome to get to know you. And I think maybe we uh, maybe we should have a um, maybe we should have another episode where we get we get deep into uh, into practicing in house with leagues and uh, maybe even talk a little bit about fantasy sports and sports gambling, which we didn't even touch on. Uh, but uh, but that'd be a great conversation. So. Well, I had a great time. I very rarely talk about in-house, but I, I will say this to everyone that is looking to get into in-house. It's about your network and developing that network, demonstrating your skill set and letting people know that you want to go in-house because a lot of people think you're happy wherever you're at. And I think we don't do enough of letting people know that that might be your next step and the next journey to in-house. So I feel very fortunate. Thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to listening to other podcasts on your channel. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.
Thanks everyone for listening to Cockpit Council. Be sure to like and subscribe.